Should you use an inheritance to pay off your mortgage or should you use it to invest for retirement? Do you know how much your monthly home payment will be after you've paid off your mortgage? And how difficult is the Series 65 exam anyway? We'll answer these questions and more on this, the 108th episode of the Dough Roller Podcast. Welcome to the Dough Roller Podcast, where the best thing money can buy is financial freedom. We help you make more, spend less, and invest the rest. And now your host, Rob Berger. Whether you're just starting out buried under a mountain of debt or well on your way to financial freedom, this is the podcast to help you take your finances to the next level. Hey, everybody. This podcast is sponsored by Betterment, the most preferred automated investing service. Betterment has cutting-edge technology to optimize returns, minimize taxes, and save you time and money. Join over 34,000 customers who have already streamlined their portfolio management at Betterment.com slash Roller. That's Betterment.com slash R-O-L-L-E-R. Well, I uh, hope you're having a good morning. At least it's, it's morning when I'm recording this podcast. I guess I don't know, know what time it is when you're listening to it, but I got my cup of coffee and I've got a great reader question, I guess listener question, I should say, uh, that I'm going to do my best to answer today. It's about what you should do if you inherit some money and you, you, you can use it to either pay off the mortgage or invest for retirement. What 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 should you do? And um, so that's what we're going to cover today uh, in the main part of the show. And, and it, that question comes up in a lot of different contexts. You know, you, you, you see it as well in something like, should you pay off your debt first or uh, invest uh, for, for retirement? You know, should you invest for retirement or fund uh, a 529 uh, education account for your, your children? Um, so, you know, the, these sorts of questions, what should we do with our money? when we have more than one reasonable option. It comes up a lot. And uh, so we're going to cover that today in response to uh, a listener's question. Uh, uh, so that's, what, that's the main topic. Before we get to that, though, you know, I mentioned that I passed the Series 65 exam, and I mentioned it in the weekly newsletter. I, first of all, I got a lot of responses, just folks saying congratulations. And, and I don't know why, but it kind of surprised me. And I was so pleasantly surprised. I appreciate uh, I appreciate the the thoughtfulness. I don't I don't know why that would surprise me. You know, it, uh, the email goes out to over eighteen thousand people. You might you know I guess a few people would hit the reply and say good job, I, but I wasn't expecting that. The other thing though I wasn't expecting was a lot of people wanted to know exactly what's on the exam and is it hard. Apparently, a number of you out there are thinking about taking it. So I thought I'd spend just a couple of minutes telling you a little bit about that exam and uh, a little tidbit by the way uh, that may surprise you about certified financial planners. Uh, which, by the way, have absolutely nothing directly to do with the Series 65 exam. And then we'll finish off the show. I've got a, 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 a tip of the day. It's actually a tool uh, that I ran across, a free tool, uh, that I think you might uh, find helpful, particularly if you're getting close to that age where you're thinking about taking your Social Security benefits. So uh, that's what we're going to do today. Let's get started. So the Series 65 exam is it's 140 questions long. They're all multiple choice. Ten questions don't count, but you, but of course you don't know which ten. They're sprinkled throughout the exam, and they do that so that they can test questions for use in future exams. So basically, you know, test takers act like guinea pigs for those ten questions. So your score is based on 130 questions. You need this. You need to. You need a 72 percent to pass. I didn't do the math. I think that's like 92 questions, right? Something like that. And it's you know beyond that it's just pass fail you don't you know you don't get any extra credit if you happen to nail all 130 questions which by the way I did not do uh, but uh, that's basically how the test works you have three and a half hours to take it I actually kind of went through it pretty quickly I was done in about an hour and twenty minutes and uh, felt so confident I didn't even actually go back and check any of my 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 answers which I had anticipated doing part of the reason was. Uh, I had taken a number of practice exams through Kaplan. I used Kaplan's study material. And uh, I think those those practice exams were much harder or, or, or noticeably harder than the actual exam. So when I got done with the questions you know, on the exam, I felt, I felt pretty confident. And uh, although I, I tell you what you do is you hit, a, you, know, you hit a button that says you're done, and you know, then they ask you a question that basically says, are you really sure? Because once you hit this next button, we're going to give you your grade, and that's that. And then you sit there for about 30 to 60 seconds on pins and needles while they calculate your score and check your answers you know, electronically, of course. And um, then they spit out your, 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 your um, score and whether you passed or not. So that's kind of how the exam uh, works. So what's on the exam? Well, 
the the study guide that you get from Kaplan anyway is over 600 pages long. Although if that's intimidating, um, some of that includes an index and a glossary, so we can take all that out. It's only 575 pages long if you ignore that stuff. Uh, yeah, it's pretty dense. And so if you had absolutely no background in law or or investing, it, it would be a tough. You'd have to spend some time. It'd be a lot to memorize. Uh, and that's really what it is. I mean, there are, there are very few calculations that you actually have to perform. I think uh, they do give you a four-function calculator. I think I used it on one or two questions. They also give you some um, um, uh, a pen and something to write on. And I think I did a couple of calculations by hand. Uh, but I, it couldn't have been more than four or five questions. And the calculations were very, very simple. Uh, nothing uh, uh, complicated. And uh, so it's it's really not about calculations so much. It's really about memor- memorizing a lot of stuff. And you know what I found was there were some sections of this that I just knew cold. I wouldn't have you know needed to study for them. Uh, an example of that would be stuff on like retirement accounts. I mean, you know, I think I mentioned in a previous podcast one of them was the five year rule as, as it relates to Roth IRAs. Well, I you know I've been looking at that in, in, intensely here recently. It's part of the podcast, part of the show. So. You know, there were some sections that I wouldn't need to study much for, but there are others that were very new to me. I mean, there's you know questions on broker dealers, for example, and I'm I'm never going to be an agent for broker dealer, at least as far as I can tell. Uh, it's just not something I've ever needed to know about, and uh, probably not something I'll ever need to know about again. Uh, but it's something I did need to know about on the exam. So, so what does the exam cover? Well, I'm, I'll just kind of go through this quickly. Uh, the first thing, and I, I'm just looking at the study materials that Kaplan sent me because they break it up into the basic units of the exam. The first one is equity and debt security. So, you know, you need to understand the different types of, of equity, you know, the difference between preferred and common, for example, and elements of preferred. Uh, um, so, this is, for example, the difference between cumulative and non-cumulative uh, preferred. And, um, you know, things, things like the preferreds get paid their dividends before the common shareholders get paid dividends. And uh, the, the risks of owning uh, stock and things like that is compared to bonds, right? And then for bonds, you know, you need to know things like the calculating the current yield. And um, we've talked a bit about this in the past, but the fact that a bond will typically sell at a discount or a premium, depending on where, usually depending on where interest rates have moved since the bond was issued, it could be based on other things too, like um, uh, the credit quality of the, of the um, issuer. So, you know, things, things like that. And then the nature of REITs, for example, that, that comes up, and ADRs um, and, uh, and things like that. So just the sort of high-level understanding of, of debt and equity securities. That's sort of one whole section. I don't remember how many questions came out of that. Probably not more than 10, as I can recall. But um, that was one section. And then uh, the other thing was the next section kind of related, but it was other security products. So, for example, you needed to have a basic understanding of derivatives and options. Nothing uh, in depth at all, but you you needed to understand uh, uh, the basic concept of of a derivative being uh, a security that, that that's price is based on an underlying asset, right? So, like just a simple one would be an option, right? The value of an option is based on the the value of the of, of the underlying security. You, a basic understanding of puts and calls, uh, which again, um, I, I can actually thank a good friend of mine who who basically all his investing is in puts and calls, and he and I have coffee about once a month, and he regales me with his stories of, of, of profit and loss in the, in the options market. And, and it's from those monthly uh, meetings at Starbucks that I, I know what I need to know about calls and puts. Uh, I'm actually, um, you have to get qualified to be able to, uh, to trade options. You know, you can't just open up a brokerage account and start selling or buying calls and puts. Um, and uh, so, but I, I did that through my SEP account at Vanguard. So I can now buy Certain I can trade in certain options. I just haven't done it yet, um, and we'll see if I do. And if I do, I'm, I'm sure I'll report it to you. And I'm sure it'll be ugly. <laughs> uh, you need to understand insurance-based products. You know the, the annuities um, and uh, di- different types of life insurance. Um, again, it doesn't go into great detail. It would be nowhere near comparable to the exam you'd have to take to become a licensed in, you know insurance broker or salesperson. So, but you know you do need to understand you know, the, the ideas between a fixed annuity and a variable annuity and things like that. Uh, so that was part of the exam uh, as well. And that, that kind of at a high level was the second part of the second unit. Um, the third one was, there are 10 of them, I'll go through them here quickly. The third one was trading securities. So just the different, basically the different types of market orders and the difference between a bid and ask and the spread. 
um, things like that. Oh, dividends. They did have questions on dividends and understanding the declaration date, the ex-dividend date. You know, these are things that will come up in the dividend series that I've started and actually owe you all <laughs> another installment in that. I know what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about the importance of looking at the growth of dividends and evaluating a company. That's going to be the next podcast in that series. But in any event, I'll cover, I'll cover these other things too, like uh, ex-dividend date and things like that. Retirement plans. This was pretty straightforward for me because I kind of live and breathe this stuff. But, you know, IRAs, 401ks, Kios, the you know, Roth versus uh, traditional, uh, and those sorts of things, as well as educational uh, savings programs like the 529 plan. I uh, had to know a n- number of things about just opening a customer account, uh, so that's important. Uh, then the sixth thing, uh, portfolio management styles and taxation, so asset allocation, those sorts of things, and um, uh, understanding risk and you know what would be an appropriate, or the word is suitable, uh, investment for an individual, uh, given certain cir- circumstances that they might provide in a question on the exam, understanding taxes, understanding, you did have to have a, at least a high level understanding of the different corporate forms and and the pros and cons. So, you know, should you start, should you, should you form your business as a sole proprietorship, an LLC, a partnership, a limited partnership, an S corp, a C corp, and what are the sort of the ramifications? Typically around one, are you, are you protected from liability? And two, what are the tax consequences uh, of of the of the corporate form that you've selected? And uh, I guess as a third one, uh, how easy or, or, or difficult does a does a particular corporate form make it for you to raise money? So those sorts of issues uh, uh, came up uh, on the exam. And then uh, the seventh one was economic factors and just sort of business information, strategies, and risks, things about um, uh, GDP and and CPI. Um, risk measures, correlation, uh, uh, the correlation coefficient, standard deviation, beta, alpha, sharp ratio, things like that, Monte Carlo simulations, you had to understand that. Again, there were on any one of these things, there might only be one question. Uh, so this is a very, um, it's more of a, you think of it, it's not a deep test, it's more of a broad, you, know, you need to know a little bit about a lot of stuff. Uh, is kind of how this, how I look at this exam. You need to understand interest rates and the yield curve, um, this is all in this part of sort of economic factors, this, this seventh unit, um, uh, investment return, how you measure it, um, things like that. And then the last three sections all were sort of legal for the most part. They, the, the, there was a section on federal securities regulations, so this would be things like the 33 Act, the 34 Act, um, Reg D, which you know, deals with uh, private placements, um, insider trading, powers of the SEC, um, you know, things of, of that nature. You need to understand the Investment Company Act of 1940. Um, there, were, there were questions about, uh, about, about that. And then state regulations, basically the Uniform Securities Act. Uh, that was the ninth unit. And then the tenth unit dealt with, finally, the thing that I'm looking at, federal and state regulations of investment advisors and their representatives. Um, so uh, that was the exam. I probably studied for, I don't know, 10 hours maybe, I would say. And that consisted of uh, reading that book, and in some places I'd skim it, and some places I'd read it very carefully. You know, there were some obviously some things there that I just wasn't familiar with, and other things where I was more comfortable. Um, and then probably at least half that time was actually spent taking the exams. And one of the things that I found when I was taking these practice exams is that I was moving through them very, very quickly. So I would take a practice exam of 130 questions. I'd be done in 50 minutes. Um, and that actually gave me some comfort because I thought going in that I would have plenty of time to reread all the questions. As I said, I ended up not doing that. Probably not a smart move, but it worked, it worked out well for me. Um, and, uh, you know, if by comparison, it wasn't nearly as difficult as the bar exam. I'll, I'll tell you that. Uh, of course, the bar exam is two days. This one, as I said, took me about an hour and 20 minutes. But um, that's sort of a high level view of, of the Series 65 exam. You know, if you have specific questions about it, uh, you know, feel free to shoot me an email. I'll do my best to to, to answer them. Uh, but that was my experience with it. Not particularly difficult. Um, now, I mentioned the CFP, um, so Certified Financial Planner. It's kind of interesting. You know, the Series 65 exam allows you to then, once you've passed that, it allows you uh, to to be licensed uh, in your state as uh, you could, for, if you're going to form your own company, a registered uh, investment advisor, an RIA, and then what you become is the investment advisor representative of your own firm, or perhaps you're going to go work for a, a, another firm. 
The interesting thing about a certified financial planner, I think it's a very important designation and one that I'm working towards, but it doesn't actually uh, qualify you to, there's nothing, there's no um, financial planning work that requires you to be a CFP. And that may surprise some of you. It's not as if you, you know, you can, you can give, uh, you can do financial planning work without being a CFP. Um, the CFP is more of sort of a, a credibility booster, if you will. There are, there are certain education requirements you have to meet to become a CFP. You then have to take an exam to become a CFP. And then you have the certain experience requirements. So there's a lot going into it. It's not an easy uh, credential to obtain. Uh, so in that sense, I think it's, it's a very good one, but it's not a requirement to become a financial planner. And that may surprise a lot of you. However, if you become a financial planner, um, there are certain things you can do without anything, you know, uh, without any particular license. Like, for example, you could help folks come up with a plan to get out of debt or a plan to you know, help them budget and manage their money. A lot of folks that do that call themselves money coaches, uh, but there's no particular, you know, uh, credential you need to do that. However, if it's part of your financial planning practice, you want to start helping people, say, figure out what they should invest in inside their 401k or help them build an asset allocation uh, plan. Once you start to get into the investment side of things, you can run into trouble if, you don't, if you're not a registered investment advisor or an investment advisor representative. And that gets us back to the Series 65 exam. That would actually be required um, under, under certain circumstances as you move from sort of just sort of money management advice, if you will, over into either the investment world. And that would include, by the way, uh, li- uh, helping p- folks evaluate life insurance products that have an investment component. Um, so that's where people can get tripped up and where you've got to be really, really careful. But what surprises a lot of people is the CFP actually isn't required in all of that. Uh, it's, a, it's a very, I think, a, a very good credential, but it's not uh, a, a requirement uh, like the Series 65 is to become a, an investment advisor. So just a little bit of background there. Uh, on that, of course, there are many other designations. I'm only I've only talked about the two, right? But um, you know, you can become a chartered financial analyst, a CFA, and that would be someone who would be you'd be focused very much on investing uh, in, in that regard. So, you know, there are a lot of folks that run investment advisory firms that manage folks' investments, and they're not a CFP, but they're a CFA, uh, or you know, in my case, a lawyer, or some of them are C- CPAs, and that's kind of how they got into the business. So. Um, just a little bit of background there. Okay, so let's move on to the main topic. And um, this comes from a listener named Shelly. And uh, great email. Here's what she says. She says, great job on your podcasts. I started listening over the summer, and they are great. You thoroughly go over a topic and are good about discussing the pros and cons. I really did not pay as much attention to mutual fund costs before, but I do now. After you explained about how this will impact my returns, my average for the mutual funds I own is 75 basis points. Uh, which I learned using the Morningstar tool, which was free through T. Rowe Price, which is not awful. She's referring to the 75 basis points, but I know I can do better. Let me just stop there. For th- those kind of emails just make my day. I'm so happy to hear uh, that the podcasts have had that impact o- on her and that she's focused on her investing costs. And, uh, and that's just a, t- a terrific. It, by the way, it raises a question. You may be saying, well, Rob, if you're going to help people manage their investments, are you going to have to charge? Well, <laughs> yeah, I will. And uh, that'll be a whole other topic for a podcast down the road. I'm actually hard at work at figuring out how I can do that for the least amount of money as possible because, you know, I hate, I hate fees. So anyway, uh, Shelley goes on. I have a question that perhaps might be a topic for a podcast. I am anticipating an inheritance in the near future of about 150000 This amount is roughly the remaining balance on my mortgage. What are the pros and cons to paying off your mortgage, mortgage instead of investing the money for retirement? I am currently behind where I should be for my retirement savings, so I am tempted to use the money to turbocharge savings for retirement. Yet the idea of paid off house is pretty tempting. I live in a high cost of living area, and my husband and I are not planning to stay in our home long term, maybe at a maximum seven more years. Hmm. We have equity in the house, and we can probably take it and pay cash for a condo or townhome in another part of the country. I am 51, and my husband is 56. And I do not plan to retire until 68. Any thoughts on where one should put a windfall? What a great question. And uh, it's, it's, it's a great kind of question in part because, at least in my view, there's no easy one right answer. You know, I know if you, if you listen to other financial folks, 
um, authors, radio personalities, whatever, they're probably going to have some sort of opinion that's going to be, you know, you need to go do X. That's that's the right answer. Um, I just don't don't think about personal finance that way in most cases. And I mean, there are certainly times when, yeah, there's really just one answer or there are cases where a, a you, you know you might be considering a course of action and it's just a really bad idea, right? Uh, but in cases like this, I don't think there is just one right answer. So what I thought I would do to respond to Shelley's question as best as I can is uh, to come up with a list of things that that I would consider if uh, I were in her situation. And I come up with uh, with ten. You may have more. Uh, and so when I get done with my list, if you've got more, please email me. I'd love to hear from you. Uh, but I've got ten, and we're going to walk through them. Number one, calculate your monthly home payment after your mortgage is paid off. Now, this may seem odd. Uh, you say, well, once you've paid off your mortgage, isn't it paid off? Yes, it is, but you still have monthly payments that you must make even after you've paid off your mortgage. And actually, there are three of them. If you're ahead of me on this, you may be thinking of two of them, uh, but there are actually three. And uh, here's what they are. The first one is homeowner's insurance, right? Even once you've paid your mortgage off, you're still going to have homeowner's insurance. For most people, they pay that as part of their mortgage payment. It goes into escrow, which is just a fancy way of saying the bank holds on to it in a safe place. They don't commingle it with the bank's other money. They keep it separate, and then they pay your homeowner's insurance for you, uh, usually twice a year. Uh, why do they do that? Because they want to make sure your homeowner's insurance is paid. They don't want to just leave that into your hands to pay it. They want to take the money from you themselves and pay it themselves because your home is securing the loan, and they want to make sure your home is insured in case something bad happens. So that gets paid as part of your mortgage. Once you pay off your mortgage, then you'll be paying your homeowner's insurance on your own, but you still got to pay it. So that's that's the first expense, what I call the monthly home payment. It's not a mortgage, right? You've paid off the mortgage in this scenario, but that's part of your what I call your monthly home payment, your homeowner's insurance. The second one, real estate taxes, right? And you're going to still pay those real estate taxes. They're probably part of your escrow as well. They just get bundled into your mortgage payment, and they're easy to forget about. But once your mortgage is paid off, you'll continue to pay your real estate taxes. So that's the second payment that you'll make. The third one, uh, maybe not quite a payment is the right word, but it's this. Once you pay off your mortgage, assuming you itemize your deductions on your taxes, you'll no longer have the deduction on your the, the interest portion of your mortgage payment, which will mean your taxes will go up. Now, again, this only applies if you're itemizing your deductions. Not everyone who owns a home itemizes their deductions. Uh, but if you do, uh, you will lose that deduction. And uh, I don't think, by the way, I'm not saying this is a reason not to pay off your mortgage. But what I, I am trying to get at is this. I think it's important as you consider what's best for you to figure out how much you'll actually save each month if you pay off your mortgage. And you can't do that until you figure out what your homeowner's insurance bill is going to be, what your real estate tax bill is going to be, and the tax consequences of paying off your mortgage. Now, remember, if you itemize your taxes, real estate taxes are deductible from federal income tax as well. So you got to do a little math here to figure out what the impact will be of paying off your mortgage. One easy, although not perfectly precise way, is to figure out what your interest payments were last year and multiply that by your marginal tax rate, right? And uh, that will give you a rough idea. I say rough idea because for, it won't be perfect for a couple of, uh, potentially for a couple of reasons. One is, if you're having your typical amortizing 15 or 30 year loan, the amount of interest you pay each year will go down as your balance goes down. So the value of the deduction actually will get a little bit lower uh, each year. Uh, so it won't be the same from year to year. The other thing is, depending on your income, you may not get the full benefit of all your deductions. As you make more and more money, good for you, but um, the government says, yeah, you don't get the full benefit of those deductions. You're going to lose some of that. And, you know, there could be alter alternative minimum, minimum tax issues. So you know, it, the, the real true down-to-the-penny benefit could be difficult to calculate, but you should be able to get a rough idea of it. And I think I think that's the first step, and the first thing that I would consider in response to Shelley's question is, how much will I actually save month to month if I pay off my mortgage? That, understanding that cash flow, um, I think, is an important first uh, step so that you have a sense as to exactly what the benefit will be. If, in this case, you take $150,000 to pay off your mortgage, uh, this you know, step one won't, uh, probably won't answer the question for you. But I can tell you that I did this Oh, about a year ago. And I was actually surprised at the answer. Uh, I mean, you know, certainly paying off our mortgage would save us a lot of money each month. 
but it wasn't quite as, as much as I thought it would be when I added back in these, these costs that I would have to continue to pay, as well as the loss of the interest uh, deduction. So that's the first thing that, that I would look at. The second thing I would look at, it's kind of related, is your current cash flow. What's your current budget look like? Are you strapped each month? Uh, are, you know, or, or do you have you know, some cushion each month and you're saving uh, for retirement and other things? You know, the current cash flow could have a big impact on on this. If you're, you know, um, living month to month and maybe even going into a little bit more debt, and the the mortgage payment is a real burden for you, um, that might that might um, that might counsel towards paying off the mortgage. One of the things you need to do here, though, I think, is to be very very honest with yourself. If you're having cash flow issues, you know, is it is it because of the mortgage and 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 that sort of thing, or is it because you're spending money in other areas where you shouldn't be spending them, right? So yeah, this is where you have to really be honest with yourself and your your budget and your cash flow. Uh, but it is an important consideration, you know. If if on the other hand, you know your cash flow is great, and you know you don't need the the extra money you generate by paying off your mortgage, well, then that might counsel in favor of of not paying off the mortgage again. Um, there are a number of things to consider. This is just one of them, but I think current cash flow is an important consideration. So that's the second one. The third one, uh, and I think very important and uh, something that Shelley alludes to in her email, and that is all of the other financial goals that you have. You really shouldn't look at this question in isolation from everything else uh, that's going on in your life. And Shelley uh, is, is, I think, looking at this the right way because she's looking at, you know, she's got her current age, how long she wants to work, when she's going to retire, where they're going to live uh, during retirement, all of these sorts of uh, um, of other sort of related but 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 different uh, financial priorities and financial goals. So a couple that come to mind, some of which she alluded to. One is um, you you really want to be, if you can, debt free when you retire. I think that's a really important goal, and it's important for one primary reason. You know, we talk about how much of your nest egg you can spend each year in retirement. Four percent is sort of a general rule of thumb, but for me, the more flexibility you have, uh, the better. So if you have the flexibility to one year, say, only take out 3%, for example, that will help you weather a bad stock market where the market's down, your nest egg's down, and maybe you cannot take out as much in a bad year. But that flexibility, I think, only comes when uh, you've got a lot of room in the budget and being debt-free in retirement uh, is one big step in making that happen. So in, 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 in the case of paying off your mortgage, one of the questions I'm asking is, well, if I don't pay it off with a lump sum, can I still be debt-free at retirement? Right? Will I still be out of my mortgage at retirement? I think for most of us, it might mean simply by making my monthly payments, maybe paying a little bit extra, will I be debt-free? In Shelley's case, it sounds like they will be debt-free because they plan to move in seven years and I guess downsize and will be able to pay cash for the, the new home, the condo or the townhome with the equity. So it sounds like she has this part of it uh, covered, but it is an important uh, consideration, right? So that gets down to, again, whether you'll be debt-free if you, if you don't use the money to pay off the loan, can you still get out of that mortgage by the time uh, you retire? Now, another thing I would ask is, in Shelley's case, I would say, well, what would be the ramifications if you couldn't move in seven years? How, in other words, another way to ask that is, how important is it that you move in seven years? And you say, well, why is that a question? Well, imagine she decided not to um, pay off the mortgage and she put the money in the stock market. And we had a repeat of 2008, 2009. So what, what would that look like? Well, her current home would probably go down in value significantly. The amount of her equity in her home would go down because because real estate prices tanked, Right. And at the same time, she'd lose about, depending on her, her asset allocation, 20, 30, 40% of the 150,000 she just put in the market. Talk about a one two punch, right? Now, so that, that could mean uh, some big changes in her financial goals as to when she can move, maybe even when she can retire. And so, one of the questions you have to ask is just how flexible are your financial plans? And, you know, and it really forces you. Uh, to identify what your priorities are. So in Shelley's case, the question might be, well, what if you couldn't move in seven years, right? Or what if you had to continue to work beyond the age of 68, right? Um, uh, the other question I'd ask is, why not move earlier? You know, you could have your cake and eat it too. Why not move now, downsize, pay cash for your condo or townhouse, and invest your $150,000 in the stock market? You've got them both. Now, 
in Shelly's case, there may be very good reasons why you know she doesn't want to move right now or she can't move right now. Uh, but sometimes I think in answering these questions, it's important to think outside of the box. And so that'd be one question if I were advising her. You know, that, you know, that's one question I'd ask. Why not move earlier? Okay, so again, all of this relates to your other financial goals, understanding what they are, understanding what your priorities are, and asking, asking some what-if questions. You know, what if you move now? What if you don't move in seven years, you move in 10 years? Uh, that sort of thing. Now, the fourth question, uh, 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 consideration is something we've already addressed in Shelley's case, but again, is how long you do plan to live in the house. I do think that's an important consideration. You know, if you're going to move in a year, you know, you might say, well, what's the point of paying it off uh, versus say you plan to live there through retirement? Uh, So I do think that is a a relevant consideration. Obviously, in Shelley's case, she plans to move in seven years. Uh, um, I don't know. In her case, you know, does that weigh in favor one way or the other? Uh, I, I, my instinct tells me most people would say it weighs in favor of not paying off the mortgage. I think that's probably as much a psychological perspective as, as it is a mathematical one. Uh, but uh, probably at the seven-year mark, you know, it's probably hard to get feel real strongly one way or another. Uh, but certainly what you plan to do with your home, how long you plan to live in it, um, is, a, is an important consideration. It sounds like one she's already thinking about. Okay, number five, um, an obvious one, but we got to say it, what's the interest rate on your mortgage, right? The lower the rate, the more you might want to keep that money and uh, invest it in the stock market. Um, I say the stock market, it doesn't have to be the stock market. You might invest it in, 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 in lower risk bonds. You might invest it in a combination, right? Uh, but in our case, for example, our, we have a 30-year fixed at three and seven eighths. After we factor in taxes, it puts the, the, the effective rate under, under, under 3%. While I've paid off the mortgage, uh, uh, in some cases we've paid extra on the mortgage, I'm not in a huge hurry to pay it off uh, because of that low interest rate and the tax benefits brings it down below 3%. And uh, long term, I'm confident I'll do better than that investing. Now I say long term, I stress that. In the short term, you know, boy, I can you know, lose 20, 30, 40%. But if I'm looking at 10 or 15 years or more, then I feel much more comfortable. But certainly the interest rate on your mortgage is going to be uh, an important consideration. Okay, number six, your risk tolerance. And I, I want to kind of have you think about this in, in two different ways. The first is probably the most obvious, and that is the risk of investing in the, in the market or in, in a um, diversified portfolio. You know, how would you react to a 30% loss of that investment? You know, now, I like to translate everything into numbers. Uh, percents kind of get lost. So for one hundred and fifty thousand dollars, thirty percent would be forty five grand if I'm doing my math right. So you know, in one year, you go from one hundred and fifty to one hundred and five thousand, and you've still got your mortgage. You're going to be able to live with that. You're going to be able to stick to your investment plan because uh, eventually it's going to go back up. But it could take five or ten years. You're going to be okay with that. Uh, so now the answer to that may not necessarily mean you pay off your mortgage, right? It could mean uh, you're a little more conservative in your investments, or it may mean, yeah, you do pay off your mortgage, but it's an important consideration. There's no one right answer here. Uh, I think, you know, obviously folks' risk tolerance can be different, but that's, um, that's an important consideration. The second type of, of risk tolerance question is this, does the fact that you have a mortgage keep you up at night? I mean, I think for a lot of people, there's a, a, just a, a good sense of security and accomplishment uh, for paying off your mortgage, that used to be that really used to be the case. I remember shows you how old I am. Maybe some of you remember this too. An episode of All in the Family where where Archie and Edith paid off their mortgage and they they burned the mortgage. I don't know if you guys remember, if anyone remembers that. Shoot me an email. I have a vivid memory. I was of course a kid when that came on, um, but I have a vivid memory of that episode. And I had I, I think I remember talking to my parents because I had absolutely no idea what they were talking about burning the mortgage. Um, that's not so much, you know, it doesn't seem to be such a, a big deal today. Uh, but for a lot of folks, and I think this is perfectly uh, fine and a good goal, there's just a, lot, a good feeling of paying off that mortgage. And, uh, you know, you want to kind of keep your emotions in check. At least I try to when I'm talking about investing. Uh, but if your mortgage is keeping you up at night, that, that's, uh, I think, an important consideration to, 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 you know, factor in as to what's best for you. Okay. Okay. Um, Number seven, a question to ask yourself, what will you do with the money if you don't pay off the mortgage? Now, so far in this episode, we've kind of just assumed it would be invested 
uh, in uh, some portfolio, in, in Shelly's case, for retirement. That's her situation, but your situation may be very different. What will you do with the money if you don't pay off the mortgage? So if the answer is go on a, um, a trip around the world for a year, that, by the way, that may be a perfectly great answer for you. Uh, but whatever the answer is, you're going to need to weigh that versus having a, a mortgage paid off. Part of it is looking at opportunity costs. What's the best use of your money? Uh, and I think that's really kind of where Shelley is. And I think that's uh, probably where, where most of us would be. But some of us, you know, maybe, I don't know, maybe you want to use the money to start a business. Uh, maybe you want to use some of the money to give to charity. Um, you know, there, there could be, there's a hundred thousand, thousands of different options, right? But it's important to think about if you're not going to pay off the mortgage, what are you going to do with the money? And, and I'll add here too, um, you know, it's not all or nothing. It's not you pay off the mortgage or don't pay off the mortgage. You know, one could decide to put $75,000 towards the mortgage. That won't change your monthly payment, but it will lower the interest you're paying and speed up the time that you're mortgage free, Right. And use the other to invest for retirement or do something else with it. So it's not all or nothing, right? Uh, but again, I think it's an important question. What will you do with the money if you don't pay off the mortgage? Number eight is kind of related, the flip side of this. What will you do with your extra cash flow on a monthly basis if you do pay off the mortgage? So in other words, if you pay off your mortgage, you know, you're know you not going to save 100% of your mortgage payment, right? We talked about that in, 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 in uh, number one. You're going to have to you're going to have your real estate taxes, you're going to have your insurance, loss of interest deduction potentially, but you are going to free up some cash. What, do, what are you going to do with that? I think some folks may say, you know, I'm not very good with managing my money, and I know if I pay off my mortgage, I'm going to blow that money on stuff I really don't need. So by keeping my mortgage, I kind of force myself to do something smart with that mortgage payment every, every month by paying my mortgage. And while I'm not good on a monthly basis with my cash flow, I am good with lump sum money. I'll, I'm confident I'll take that 150000 and put it towards my retirement. So here, you really got to know yourself, you know, and, and, and know how, how you're going to spend that money. So, you know, that's, the, that's tip, tip number eight or consideration number eight. What will you do with the extra cash flow if you, if you do pay off the mortgage? All right, number nine. Uh, by the way, I hope you're finding this helpful. When I read a lot about this issue... A lot of times it's, it's simply, well, compare your interest rate on your mortgage to what you'll make in the stock market. Well, that's, that's important. That's one consideration. But boy, that really only scratches the surface. I mean, this is, these questions are much bigger than mortgage versus stock market. Uh, they really need to encompass just about every area of your finances as well as your own approach to money and your own ability to manage it. All right. Uh, number nine, are you prepared for the unexpected? We kind of touched on this a little bit, but you need to ask yourself these questions. For example, and I mentioned this, what if Shelly can't, can't work until age 68? What if she becomes disabled? What if she loses her job? Um, you know, these are things we don't like to think about, I understand. Uh, but, but these are questions that should be asked. What's going to happen then? And how, would, how does your decision look? Now, you know, she may have very good disability insurance at work. Um, she may be in a, in a career where even if she did lose her job, she could get another job very easily, or maybe not, right? I mean, this is going to be very indi- an individual uh, a question to think about. But in her case, that'd be a question I'd be asking her. What, what happens if you can't work until age 68? Or flip side, what if you're forced to work longer, right? And will that be a possibility for you uh, or not? And, you know, what, do you, what, what does retirement look like for you? So you, you really want to be prepared for um, the unexpected. And you can look at this, too, from a stock market perspective. Again, we've touched on it. But what if the market's down for 10 years? What if it's down for 15? And I don't mean it'll be down every single year for 15 years. But, I mean, when you look back at history, going back to the Depression, you see large chunks of time where the market's been pretty brutal. Um, you know, you can, you talk, they talk about the lost decade. I mean, you know, so things can get bad for a while and, um, you know, th- that's, it's always, un- it's, it's, it's the expected unexpected. We know it's going to happen sometime, but we don't know when, and we're always surprised when it happens, but, um, it does. So, um, you really kind of need to think, th- think about those unexpected things that might happen. Try to figure out what those look like for, for you. Uh, and then the 10th thing that I would consider are your other finances, you know, do you have an emergency fund? Uh, she mentioned she's a little behind in her retirement savings. Well, how far behind is she, right? What are your spending patterns? For example, if, if, if someone came to me with this question, um, I might say to them, so what, are you, what kind of cars do you own? You might say, well, what's that got to do with whether I pay off my mortgage? Oh, I'm just curious. Why don't you tell me? Well, 
we own a $50,000 Lexus SUV and, I don't know, a $40,000 uh, Toyota Camry. I don't know if Toyota Camrys cost that much. And, yeah, we're, we have a five-year loan on one and a seven-year loan on the other, and our, our total payments are $1,400 a month. I, I don't know. I'm making this up, of course. That's a big issue. To me, actually, that's a more important issue than whether you should pay off your mortgage or invest for retirement. Um, so you, 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 it's important to look at your, your, your other finances and how it impacts this decision, including your spending patterns. Now, in that situation, it wouldn't be, I, it wouldn't be my place to say, go sell your cars, but it would be my place to say, here's how owning those cars affects your, the other areas of your finance of your finances. And if you want to continue to own those cars, that's terrific. That's your decision. Uh, but um, in, in answering these questions, I think it's important to take a holistic view. I might have a different answer for someone who's got no emergency fund and hasn't saved anything for retirement, or there would be different you know, concerns to deal with as compared to someone who has six months in an emergency fund and maybe is a little behind in, in retirement savings, but still has a good chunk saved. Um, so, and, and then again, you know, someone whose spending patterns uh, give them a lot of uh, flexibility in their monthly budget versus someone who maybe has n- no flexibility or is in fact spending more than they make. So you have to consider these other other finances. Now, all of that said, all of these ten sort of factors that I've went uh, that I've gone through, um, it raises the question: Okay, Rob, but what would you do? Fine, there's all these factors. What would you do? Well, I can tell you what I'm doing in my situation. We uh, pay a little bit extra on our mortgage each month, not a lot, but by and large, um, what I did, we refinanced our mortgage about two years ago. That got us down to three and seven eighths. We'd been here about 10 years, so we, had, we only had 20 years left on the mortgage. Refinancing it took it back out to 30 years, something that my wife just hated. So I made a promise to her. I said, well, I will pay off enough of the new mortgage to get it back down to 20 years. And so that's what I did. So in 2000, I think it was 13, we paid a good chunk on the mortgage. That got us down to about 20 years left if we just make the, the monthly payments. And uh, I kind of stopped there. And now we do make uh, some extra payments um, uh, each month, but not huge. And the main reason is, is I want the cash. Um, the, the, the interest rates are very low on the mortgage. We'll still be uh, debt-free before we retire from the mortgage. So I've got that, uh, that, that goal checked off. Again, as best as I can tell, life always can throw surprises at you. Um, and uh, we're doing smart things uh, with the money, the money that we could be paying on the mortgage. Uh, we're doing smart things with it. Uh, smart to us, right? It's not all savings. We're giving some to charity um, and, and we're saving. And um, we, But we've got an emergency fund. Um, we've got a cushion. Uh, and that's um, our situation. If I were to inherit tomorrow... Um, the amount uh, of my mortgage. What would I do? What would I do in Shelly's case? Honestly, I'd be pretty ambivalent one way or the other. I'm not sure what I'd do. You know, it's easy to sit here and say what I do, but I haven't inherited the money. <laughs> Once you inherit the money, maybe you have a different view for it. Uh, I might lean towards paying it off uh, probably a little bit, but we're on track with our retirement savings. If I weren't on, reta- on track for our retirement savings, I'd probably lean towards saving it for retirement. But I'd also recognize that there's probably no bad decision there. So there you go. That's my take on Shelley's question. You may have all kinds of other factors that you would take into account, or maybe you just think it's easy, and there's just one answer, and it's this. Uh, uh, happy to hear from you. Shoot me an email, net, and let me know what you think. Okay, on to the tip of the day. And uh, it's a tool that I came across that I thought I'd share with you, and it's from our friends at Financial Engines. I say friends, I actually don't know anyone there, but it's a, it's a site that I'm very familiar with, and they build tools to help you figure out things related to your finances, particularly investment investments, and they have what's called a retirement readiness tool, and it's a social security planner. And um, uh, I've not worked through it, in part because I'm not anywhere near uh, taking my social security. I'm 47, almost 48 as of the recording of this podcast. So I'm not quite there yet, but I know a lot of people are in part because I get emails from folks. It's interesting. People will send me email, they'll give me all their details and they'll say, okay, when should I take social security? (laughs) And my answer back to them is, I have no earthly idea. Uh, You know, there's uh, uh, dozens and dozens and dozens of different combinations as to the ways you can take and when you should take social security. 
And as a result, there are all these tools out there, some paid, some free, to help you figure that out. You may want to hire, there's actually social security experts out there that will help you with this. Well, I found this tool, so I thought I'd pass it on. It's the Financial Engines Retirement Readiness Tool. The URL is kind of long, so the easiest way for you to get to it is just go to Google. Type in Financial Engines Retirement Readiness, and you'll see the tool. If you're near retirement, uh, it might be something uh, that you want to check out. I thought it'd be a, uh, I thought it was an interesting tool and one that I'd pass on to, to those listening who are uh, uh, um, in the position of making this very important decision. Well, there you go. Hey, hope you have a great day. If you have any questions or comments, don't hesitate to shoot me an email, net. Love to hear from you. Until next time, remember, the best thing money can buy is financial freedom. <laughs> 